Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Well, the world is getting crazier every day, isn't it? We've had some interesting events this week, and some would say that the institutions that we used to see as noble or maybe even trusted, they're being used more and more against us each and every day. But you know, assigning the blame to an institution is actually kind of a clever way to try and get around blame. Because an institution is not a living being, is it? It doesn't make choices. It doesn't make decisions. People make choices and people make decisions. And people are behind institutions. So when we blame institutions, a faceless, inanimate object takes the blame. And it's much easier to vilify an institution than to come to grips with the reality that people make up those institutions and it's people who deserve either the credit or the blame. You know, the last two and a half years probably have us questioning the people behind our institutions and their motivations more and more. And it's with that background that I'd like to ask you a question. Why are you here? It's a familiar question to many of us, but maybe a strange way to introduce it. Because we're all part of an institution of sorts, aren't we? We're part of the body of Christ. We're part of the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. You know, the faithful listed in Hebrews, they go back as far as Abel. Later, God started a nation through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when he delivered them from Egypt, he instituted a new nation. Later still, on the day of Pentecost, following Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, God instituted a new church. And we're part of that institution that God started on that day. God calls it the body of the Christ. Many times we call it the church. But just like any other institution, there's a purpose for it, and there are people behind it. So when I ask the question, why are you here? It's kind of a big, broad question with a lot of different answers. So let me get my notes here. No, I'm just kidding. No, I promised Mr. Keith I wouldn't do that to him again. <clears throat> so specifically, I'd like to narrow that down a little bit further. My title today is just two words. Why brethren? See, God instituted a church and he put people in it. And we get together each week on the Sabbath to worship together. Why did God set it up that way? Why did God give us brethren? Do we have a responsibility to each other? And if we do, what is it? So why, brethren? Well, for the first answer to that question, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> we'll read verses 24 and 25. You know, this is a scripture that we often quote when we talk about the Sabbath and meeting at church each week. But it also has some answers for us to the question we just asked. So Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, when we think of the book of Hebrews, we probably think of at least two things. The first that comes to my mind is, you know, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and him becoming our high priest. And the second is the faith chapter. And Hebrews goes into detail connecting the sacrifice Jesus made to the old covenant animal sacrifices and how he became our high priest from the Levitical priesthood to the order of Melchizedek. And the faith chapter is one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible. And the faith chapter lists many of the Hebrews of the Bible and how they showed their faith in God through their actions. 
And by the time we get to chapter 10, we're kind of building to a crescendo here of all that stuff. And these verses that we just read are kind of right in the middle of that crescendo. We're transitioning from explaining the gospel of Christ to encouraging us to be like those recorded in the faith chapter. And they're right in the middle of all that. We get these verses that tell us to make sure that we're at church together. So at first that placement might seem odd. And it might seem a little out of place, but I submit to you that that placement was intentional. See, that placement shows how important God thinks this is. It shows how important the assignment that he's giving us is. Now, we often quote this to show that there's still a Sabbath that we as Christians keep, but there's a lot more to this scripture than that. So let's look at some of these words a little bit more closely. Let's begin with this word consider. When we think about the word consider, sometimes it's got a very non-committal nature to it, right? You might use it in the same way that you would say think. As in, yeah, I'll think about it. I'll consider it. But the meaning in the Greek is a lot stronger. The word translated consider from the Greek is Strong's 2657. And it means to observe fully. And Vine says that it's a strengthened form of another Greek word, which means to perceive, to understand fully, or to consider closely. So this word implies that you dedicate time to fully understand the subject matter from all angles. That you know it inside and out. That you're very familiar with it. You don't just understand the subject. You might say you're a subject matter expert. So what are we supposed to fully understand? Is it the Sabbath, the holy days, the law of God? Well, those are all good things to understand, but that's not what we're told to fully understand here. No, we're told that we're to consider one another. We're supposed to have a good grasp on our brethren. Those that we're going to church with each week. We're supposed to consider each other to fully understand each other. And that takes time and it takes effort to really get to know each other, doesn't it? So right off the bat, we can see from these verses that we do have a responsibility to one another. We're to understand and perceive one another for a particular purpose. What is that purpose? Well, if you're reading in the King James Version, it says that we're to consider one another so that we can provoke one another. Now, at first, that doesn't sound very Christian, does it? I'm supposed to get to know you just so I can push your buttons? Well, kind of. The New King James Version translates it as stir up. And the Greek is Strong's 3948. And it means incitement to good or dispute and anger. And it also means a sharpening. Now, when I think of the word incitement, for some reason, it always goes hand in hand with the word riot. Inciting a riot. You know, that seems to be the, the way that we use it. But this is inciting to good. But there's a lot of energy behind that, right? If you incite somebody to a riot, we're supposed to incite somebody to good. Inciting someone means to really get them worked up, to urge them on, to move them to action or to provoke. So yes, we're supposed to know each other well enough to push each other's buttons, but for good. We're supposed to do it in a good way. We're to provoke one another to love and good works. The word that's translated love here is agape. You got eros, which is the love between a husband and wife, filio, the love between friends, and agape, which is the love that God has for us. So we're supposed to incite each other to develop a more perfect love. The word translated good is Strong's 2570, and it means beautiful, good, valuable or virtuous and the word translated works is strong's 2041 
and it means to work or toil as an effort or occupation. Now we're told that our Christian walk is a profession. So we're told here to incite each other to the love of God and to have a virtuous occupation. In other words, a more perfect walk with God, developing more of His character into our lives. Now we're also told here to exhort one another. The Greek word here, translated exhort, is Strong's 3870. And it means to call near, to invite, to invoke by imploration, giving advice intended to encourage or consolation. And Vines adds that it means to call to one's side, right here, come right here, or to call to one's aid. You know, sometimes we all need a little help. And we're supposed to know each other well enough that we can tell when somebody needs that help. And give them the encouragement that they need. We're to encourage them or console them as needed. Sometimes we're the one that needs help. And we're to have built relationships with each other so that we can feel comfortable calling out for others. And these are all things that we're to do with one another. You know, I mentioned that I want to focus today on what our role is to each other. You know, these verses don't tell the pastors to consider their flock so that the pastors can do all these things for the congregation. The pastors have a very, very important role, and sometimes they do assist in these things. But these verses specifically say that we're supposed to be doing these things with one another. This takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of commitment. So when are we to do all this? Well, these verses give us a clue to that as well. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The time that we spend together on the Sabbath is a perfect opportunity to build these relationships. God set aside 24 hours for us to worship Him and fellowship together. The rest of the world is going crazy, but we can come in here and we can encourage one another. Encourage one another because we all see what's happening. We don't feel like we're the only ones who see what's going on. Remind each other of the promises in God's Word. Encourage each other to continue to grow in grace and knowledge. And take time to really know one another so that we could be more effective with our encouragement. And as we get closer to the end times, we're supposed to do this even more. Because we're going to need it. Which brings us to our second answer to the question, why brethren? Let's turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and we'll read verse 12. Because God didn't intend for us to be on an island out here by ourselves. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and verse 12. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, plywood is a composite material. It's made from sheets of wood that are very, very thin, and they use some glue to keep them together. Now, the glue kind of bonds them together so that the layers stay in place with one another, but the strength of the finished product actually comes from the thin layers of wood. And the strength of the finished product is much stronger than the strength of the individual layer. Take this pack of paper, for example, right? How, who's feeling really strong today? You want to try to rip that in half, the whole pack? You can't do it, right? But you can easily tear one sheet of paper, right? So if you're going to try to tear that whole pack of paper, there's only one way that you can do it. You've got to take each sheet out individually. 
and tear it. And that's what this verse is talking about. It's the same for ropes. When you twist or otherwise put two ropes together, the strength increases. There's strength in numbers. You know, when two horses are yoked together, they can pull more than double what a single horse can pull. And it's the same for people. When people work together, they have more strength. Think of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're foreigners in a land as slaves. There were young men who were just being brought into the palace to learn all the different ways of Babylon. And the first thing that they do is they have their names changed. Yet they still find the courage to stand up for what is right. And they refuse to eat the unclean food that the king was offering them. Now, had they been alone, it might have been more difficult for them to stand up. But together, they could draw on the strength from each other. We're told in Luke that Jesus sent out his disciples in pairs. So if two is better than one, then certainly a whole congregation is even better, right? God gives us each other to draw strength from each other, especially in times of trouble. And this world is getting more difficult to live in every day. And we're told that at the time of the end, we're going to be persecuted. And as we move closer to those times, we'll need more and more strength to face the trials that we're going to go, have to go through. And ultimately, that power and strength comes from God through His Holy Spirit. But having an ally by our side fighting the same fight, well, that's encouraging and can give us more strength as well. Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. In verse 17, and we'll look at another answer to this question, why brethren? Now, vines define the word translated provoke in Hebrews 10.24 as a sharpening. And here we find a verse that reminds us of that definition. So Proverbs chapter 27, in verse 17, says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You know, when a knife or a other cutting implement gets dull, it needs to be sharpened in order to cut properly. If a cutting implement is not properly sharp, then the cuts can become jagged, or you might have to attempt to cut multiple times, right? You might have to put excessive force on the implement, which could cause it to slip. It could damage whatever you're trying to cut. You might even injure yourself. So from time to time, they got to be sharpened. Well, we also need to be sharpened from time to time. We're told to put on the whole armor of God and that the word of God is our sword. And any good sword needs to be sharp. One of the ways that we sharpen it is by talking to each other. Especially on the Sabbath, we have an opportunity to talk about God and his word. We can talk about what we've been studying, what we've been meditating about, what we have questions about. But the sharpener needs to be made of a suitable material in order to sharpen, right? Iron sharpens iron. It's kind of hard to sharpen it with paper or down or, you know, something, something else. So we need to be prepared for those conversations with our own Bible study and prayer so that we can give and take with our brethren. How about another answer to the question, why brethren? Well, it's to serve one another. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll read verses 4 through 7. It 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So this passage goes on to list out some of those specific jobs in the church and compares them to body parts. Right? We got two eyes, we got two hands, we got two feet, we got one nose, one mouth. You know, if all of our body parts were all eyes, how would we walk? How would we eat? How would we hear? Well, the body of Christ is no different. We've all got different gifts that we can use in order to serve our brethren. And Christ gave us the ultimate example of service. He came and He died for us so that we could have eternal life. And He washed His disciples' feet as Passover and told us to follow that example of service. And we do that at Passover and throughout the year, follow that example of service. And he further expounded on that in the parable of the talents, right? He told his disciples that the kingdom of God is like a man who leaves some money with his servants. The faithful servants used that money to make more money while he was away. The unfaithful servant buried it and did nothing with it. God's given us all blessings of talents. They may not all be the same, but we've all got something. And we can serve God and grow those talents by serving each other. And God expects us to use what He's given us to bear fruit. And that means serving others or developing new talents with what He's already given us. We should be looking for ways that we can serve each other, both at church and at home. Well, we've talked about all the encouraging things, maybe not all the encouraging things, but several encouraging things that we can do for each other as brethren. So now we start to get to the more uncomfortable part of the message. Because it's not always rainbow and sunshines, is it? Let's turn over to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And we'll read verses 16 through 20. Because here we can find two more answers to the question, why brethren? So James chapter 5, and verse 16, says, Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The affectant fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Well, there, I think there is at least two prerequisites for this scripture. And the first goes back to what we were talking about in Hebrews chapter 10. To do this, we really need to have already built those strong relationships with one another. And the second comes from a humble understanding that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That it's not about who you have been or what you have done but who you are becoming and what you're doing. See, God wants us all to change. And they say that the best disinfectant is sunshine. And my experience is bringing things into the light is a great disinfectant indeed. See, when things stay in the dark, they tend to fester. And the best way to bring them into the light is to talk about them with people. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ with all the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sometimes it's pretty ugly. 
But someone coming for, for help is a totally different animal from someone who wants to flaunt it in your face. Now James connects confessing sins with praying for healing. And that is because they're sometimes related. I don't want to stress the word sometimes there because we've got examples of that on both sides in the Bible, right? The Pharisees asked Jesus who sinned that the young man was born blind. And he said, nobody sinned, but that the glory of God could be revealed in his healing. But Paul mentions that taking the Passover in an unworthy manner is a reason that many are sick and sleeping. And we have examples such as Miriam, when she sinned and spoke out against Moses, she was struck with leprosy. But either way, we all need help sometimes. And we all need prayer sometimes. And maybe what we need prayer for most of all is our spiritual lives. Now, sometimes people just need physical healing as well. And we get to pray about that too. But when we get the opportunity to help a brother or a sister with a sin that they're struggling with, then we're literally helping them down the road to eternal life. And again, James starts his epistle by addressing it to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. You know, those weren't all pastors. Sometimes we have experience fighting and overcoming a sin that a pastor may not have. If we can share that experience with others, then we serve them and God at the same time. You know, Paul had to confront Peter when he was showing favoritism to the Jews. And Paul had once persecuted and executed Christians, while Peter had been with Jesus since his ministry began. We all need correction from time to time. And having a good close friend with your best interest at heart is priceless. I've been on both sides of that myself. And I'm glad that I had a friend who I could talk to. You know, that's not an easy task. And it's got to be approached in the proper way, right? So let's go over to Galatians 6 and verse 1. And we'll find some more instructions kind of related to this. It was in there last night. There it is. Okay. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Here we got some more instructions from Paul to the Galatians kind of about this same subject. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So the only unbiased benchmark is the Word of God. And meekness is strength under control. The Bible says that Moses was the most meek man who had ever lived. And he prayed that God would spare the Israelites when they wanted to stone him. So attitude is everything when it comes to these, these verses. The attitude of the restorer must be meek. And the attitude of the receiver must be open. You know, it'd be easy for us to throw our defenses up. But we should at least listen and see if it's got any merit. You know, when Nathan the prophet was sent to King David to expose David's sin, David accepted the correction. He didn't say, off with your head, which as the king, I suppose he could have done. He could have done, but he didn't do that, did he? His response was, I've sinned. He accepted the responsibility and he repented. And even the way that Nathan told David the story, the object was to restore, not to tear down. But we're told here that if we can help to bear the burdens of our fellow brother or sister in Christ, that we're fulfilling the law of Christ. Christ came and laid down his life to take the burden of our sin away. Now, only his sinless 
life can offer salvation, but if we can be a helper to someone along their journey, then we're following the example of service that Christ left for us. You know, the Pharisees, they brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus, right? And they wanted to tempt him to see how he would respond to that situation. Instead of answering their question directly, Jesus stooped down and started writing in the dirt, he kind of ignored him, pretended he didn't hear him. So they kept on asking because they didn't like being ignored. So he stood up and he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Then he stooped back down and went back to writing in the dirt. They were basically stunned. And so they each left one by one. I'm really curious what he was writing in the dirt. It doesn't say, but that's, that's be interesting to know that someday. And when they had all left and it was just Jesus and the woman, Jesus looked around and asked the woman, where are your accusers? Does anybody condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus responded, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, he was the one that gave the Ten Commandments, right? He gave the statutes. He gave the judgments. He knew what the law said. But he corrected and he restored in perfect meekness. He didn't berate. He didn't lecture. But he made the expectations and the correction clear. Let's look at one more example over in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And we'll read verse 14. Romans chapter 15 and verse 14 says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. So Paul's here writing to the Romans, and he states that he knows that they could admonish one another. Well, what does admonish mean? It's Strong's Greek 3560. And it means to caution or reprove gently, to put into mind or to warn. Now, sometimes you get to see someone going down a bad road before they do it. Kind of like those road signs, danger, curves ahead or slippery when wet, something like that. In those cases, you get a chance to warn them ahead of time. Now, when David wanted to number Israel, Joab spoke to King David and he tried to warn him against it. He said, I don't don't number Israel. It's not a good idea. Unfortunately, David didn't heed Joab. And Israel suffered a large plague because of it. So today we just kind of scratch the surface of why God has given us brethren. God has given us each other for strong relationships to exhort, to encourage one another, to provoke each other to love and good works. He gave us brethren to sharpen one another, to serve one another, and for strength. And God gave us brethren for restoration, for prayers, and for correction when we need it. God gave us an institution and He gave us brethren. And that's why we're here. That institution has a purpose. And the people behind it make that purpose. Now all we have to do is to fulfill the calling. We have to be the kind of church that we want to be.